This is part three of your eyes and chronic disease. And we're gonna really wrap up and I think anybody who's interested in getting the eye testing, this will, we're gonna cover the big, the big three, cataract, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. And on with the show. So really, you know, I did a presentation in front of Boston Biosciences or Boston uh, BioLife today. And it was really about Understanding the endocalic system, the va vascular and uh, you know dysfunction, endothelial dysfunction, and this is really where the eye is a very good screening tool for vascular disease. A very good screening tool, um, arguably the best when it comes to screening. But see, when you do screening, you're you're kind of late in the game, sort of, because you already have pathology going on. So running risk assessments and running the, the blood labs even in people that feel perfectly healthy is arguably a, a better way to determine where you are on the health disease continuum earlier on that continuum that's an that's an important point but inflammation triggers the event and here's from the new york times well blog inflammation in middle life tied to brain shrinkage later in life and, and what that tells us is is inflammation usually is in the vasculature and every neurological and neurodegenerative disease statistically you know using a bell curve kind of approach is vascular first and that that's what we talked about at the very beginning of, on part one so you know and the thing is when you when you do things like looking at brain shrinkage with mri <clears throat> it's a very crude tool that's why the eye is a much more precise and accurate tool for measuring brain shrinkage. So let's, let's just go down into the different categories. Cataract, number one surgery in the world. Here's your lens, should be a nice, clean, clear, single cell, it's the largest single cell in your body. Uh, most cells are microscopic. Everybody can look in, in someone's eye and pretty much determine where the lens is and see it. Uh, without magnification. And when you get an opacity, an, an opaque structure in your eye, what happens is you can get uh, refraction of the uh, light or scattering of the light so it's not focusing on this little object in the back of the eye in the retina called the fovea. And so that's, you lose focus or you lose actual central vision in general, so that's the problem with cataract. Now, cataracts can occur in the young, very much unexpected, and um, wasn't really understood because they don't understand the mechanism of disease, but here we have this young girl from Africa with Ebola, and very clear nuclear cataract. You don't need a fancy optometric device. This is a very progressed nuclear cataract, and the only solution for, for someone like this is cataract surgery, but the infection, the Ebola in the eye, caused the condition. And I think the point is, you don't get a cataract if you have systemic infection. You can have systemic infection, but it also has to be in the eye to get it. And we talked about uh, Dr. Wayne Stryline's work at Harvard on ocular immune privilege. So the eye is a canary for inflammatory processes. Your labs are a much better canary for inflammatory processes. But in terms of pathology, really seeing tissue changes, the, the, the eye is incomparable in that respect. But here we have what's more commonly seen, an older individual with an age-related nuclear cataract. And you can see the cataract and formations of, of opacities here in this eye. And what Dr. Trump always said, and, and Dr. Loudon as well, is the beautiful thing about the eye is you have two. So here we have a clear lens, and here we have a cataract lens. So there's definitely a disease process. So if you're working with a good doctor, like Dr. Trump, you would never have the disease migrate into this, this fellow eye. And the statistics on that are actually quite good um, in cataract and macular disease. So, but the difference between these two is simply acute infection and inflammation versus chronic 
inflammation and infection. And I hope to get Dr. Kerry Gelb, the optometrist that runs All Docs OD, to present in the future. He created a documentary called Open Your Eyes, where he spent time in, oh, I think it was Guatemala or Costa Rica. And he interviewed three centenarians, a, a gentleman and two women that have cataracts, and they did cataract surgery on them. When you're 100, we're not worried about, you know, expression of infectious process in your eyes. You've, you've made it, okay? Um, so cataract surgery and nothing else is probably appropriate for, the, for those people. They've lived, they've lived a long, healthy life. But if you're 50 and you're starting to form a nuclear cataract, that's problematic. Now you're on a downward slippery slope and, and the outcomes aren't going to be good. So, you know, the, the device is very simple, except here where you don't even need a device. I mean, I can see cataracts in dog's eyes all the time. You know, they get cataracts too. But it's a very simple instrument. Here's Dorothy uh, Hitchmoth, who is uh, one of the high mucky mucks at the American Optometric Association and a, a good friend of mine, Victor Rosansky, posing for us. And a lot of optometrists don't have a camera attached to their slit lamp microscope. So they're just going to have to note the cataract on the sheet because they can observe it with the microscope, but they're not able to take digital images. That's, that can be the case sometimes. No big deal. The grading is adequate um, for my evaluation. I just want to know if you have a 0, 1, 1 plus, you know, 2, 3, 4 for a cataract grading. And, and all we're doing, all they're doing is shining light into Victor's eyes and looking at a thin beam of light, and just like in a room, looking to expose the smoke, the dust particles, whatever. Very, very simple, basic technique, but finely tuned to uh, looking, looking at the lens, the front of the eye. And here's the problem. Uh, the age-related eye disease study done from 1992 to 98, 11 clinical centers, almost 5,000 participants. Cataract, which we're talking about right now, you have um, a very significant increase in mortality compared to the same people without cataract, and it's usually a cardiovascular event that affects them. And here's the complete ARID study, and you can see age-related macular degeneration. Cataract's bad enough to require cataract surgery, and it's not the surgery that, that increases your mortality. It's the fact that the cataracts are so severe that they require, they really require um, surgery for you to be able to see that a cataract actually leads to higher mortality than age-related macular degeneration, which is really quite surprising when you see what this would be what's called wet age-related macular degeneration, where you actually see blood oozing out of the vessels in the eye. You see pooling of blood in the retina. You don't see any blood here. You're just seeing this, this cataract. And what, what the cataract is, to be clear, is a reaction by your immune system to produce a protein that Harvard showed in a publication in 2010 that is antimicrobial. So you hear me talking about infection and now you understand why. The, the cataract formation, the unfolded protein response or the unusual conformation of a protein, you expect the, the lens to be clear and it's full of protein that you know allows the light to transmit through it. But this opaque protein is formed for a reason to fight the infection. It's an antimicrobial peptide or protein, if you will. And then, you know, so if you just have sudden vision loss, uh, an early nuclear opacity, or cataract surgery, you can see you go from 36% mortality increase to 40% to 55%. So it's significant. And at, at this level here, it's equivalent to a diagnosis of breast cancer. Same, same kind of you know, adverse outcomes. And here I'm just honing in a little, little tighter. It's a little blurry, but just to show you the nuclear opacity and, and cataract surgery, it really should say nuclear opacity. And as they say in Boston, a, a wicked bad uh, nuclear opacity is what we have here. And just some graphics from some of the studies other than the other than the ARIDs, so there's ARIDs, Beaver Dam, Proverno, Barbados, many, many studies. And I have a list of the studies from a couple of years ago. So at least 16 studies, now there's probably 20. 
So we keep doing studies, but no one's doing anything about it. Um, so, you know, you know, you, you, you know, question, there was question, can I get rid of a cataract naturally? Dr. Carter answered that in, in part one. The answer is maybe, but more importantly, why did it form the underlying pathology, the risk assessment, the blood labs? That's how we, we answer that question. And just for your reference, some, some epidemiological, you know, disease study, uh, disease studies that relate uh, inflammation in cataract, mortality in cataract, or visual impairment, which is a cataract. Visual impairment, which is a cataract, predicts five-year mortality. Cause-specific visual impairments, cataract, you know, really what it is. Mortality and causes of mortality among cataract-extracted patients, so on and so forth. So there's, there's gobs and gobs of research asserting this. I guarantee you, if you have a cataract and you go to your eye doctor to have it done, the surgeon, the ophthalmologist, they won't suggest that, you know, you're at risk for higher mortality from cardiovascular disease. And so, you know, the, the lens is a very interesting thing. It's the largest single cell in the body. And it, it, there's, there's a stem cell layer that rejuvenates the lens all the time. So really, in some respects, cataract is also related to stem cell disease. So you can kind of trace, you know, will your stem cell, will stem cell therapy work? I'm just going to um, move on now to uh, the cortical cataract, which is also called a supranuclear cataract. And I call it the Alzheimer's cataract. So here's a nuclear one. It's affecting central vision. And the problem with the cortical cataract, it's in the periphery. It does not affect the focal plane. So let's go back to this, um, this image here. So when your cataract is out here, the light impinging on the fovea is not impacted. So your eye doctor doesn't really give a darn about these. They'll observe them, but they won't do anything more. But this cataract is really a nasty one, and it's really titrated to Alzheimer's. And here's the research, Lancet, Harvard Medical School, Goldstein, Tansy, chair professor of Harvard, published that the... Um, the Beta amyloid deposit, which is the cataract of the supranuclear cataract, which is also called a cortical cataract, is found in the lenses of people with Alzheimer's disease. And so here's from the actual research. This person also had a nuclear cataract. It's not surprising. Normally, if you have a cortical cataract, you'll also have a nuclear cataract. Not always, though. But here's the cortical or supranuclear or Alzheimer's cataract on the edge. And here's a 79-year-old woman with Alzheimer's disease, a 68-year-old woman with Alzheimer's disease. You can see they both have both types of cataract. There's the nuclear cataract there, and there's the cortical cataract. So very predictive. And you can see the formations very early on, and, and the eye doctors, your eye doctor can grade it. Now, I'm always a little bit suspicious when they report nuclear, I mean, a cortical cataract on the form and don't show me an image. Did they really look for it and look for it carefully? Because according to Dr. Tramp, you know, I'm not the optometrist or ophthalmologist. To see in the periphery of the lens way out here, you have to do more dilation. You have to use a more intense beam of light, a narrower beam of light. Um, and it's more irritating to you because of the light intensity to really highlight this supranuclear or cortical cataract. But hey, when your eye doctor says, you know, you have a, a two plus uh, cortical cataract, I have to believe them, especially if you've come to us because you have glaucoma or some cognitive impairment, then, then it all makes sense. And, and this is this is what a really good eye doctor can see right here. This is, doc this is an image from one of Dr. Trump's patients where you actually see what's called a cortical fibril. And this is an autopsy brain where a technician spent a lot of time slicing sections of the brain to, to capture that 
fibril at plaque formation in its all its glory. And you can see the similarity. But what Harvard did is they didn't just say, hey, they look the same, they must be the same. They extracted it from the lens of people with Alzheimer's and the brain with people with Alzheimer's and did every chemical and biochemical analysis they could and proved that the structure and form of this and this are chemically identical. Okay, so it's unambiguous. And what we like to, what we like eye doctors to do, but none of them are really doing it, is look at the progression and really back titrate as early as possible. If you're lucky, you're going to get an image and a, a grading of what's called a cortical fibril. But before that, there's a condition called pseudo exfoliation. And very few eye doctors will say that these two are connected, but a fibril just doesn't pop out of the blue, okay? It forms slowly. First, we have swelling of the lens called coma aberration. Then we have this Milky Way kind of con conformation in the lens. It's, it's just sort of a haze. And then it slowly starts aggregating into an organized structure, a crystal, called a fibril then the fibrils can organize into what are called cortical spokes, and then you can ultimately have a cortical cataract. I've, I've never seen one. I don't, I don't think a lot of patients, you know, when you start getting dementia, which you probably have at this point, it's very difficult to do an eye exam. So getting a, a, getting a look at a full cortical cataract is probably a very rare phenomenon indeed. So we're going to migrate away from cataracts, we're done with cataract, but it's a really important thing. Number one surgery in the world, how many people have it? So many. But now we're gonna look at age-related macular degeneration, ARMD or AMD or macular degeneration. Some people just call it macular disease. There's any, any number of, of uh, names for a macular degeneration. And so there's a, the macula is in, in the um, back of the eye, part of the retina, and they call it a damaged macula, but really what we're seeing are these little yellow globules called drusen, and drusen contains, guess what? The beta-142 amyloid um, unfolded protein, an antimicrobial peptide. Almost, not exactly, but almost the exact same one you see in a nuclear cataract. However, exactly the same one you see in a cortical cataract. So here a nuclear cataract is the so-called 140 beta amyloid, whereas the cortical cataract has the 1-42 beta amyloid, which is the same one found in the brain. Just a little distinction for you. But So here's what's called the fundus camera, and Don Anderson's the world expert on this. He studied this for eons, and it's the one that really... If he didn't discover it, he made the world aware that these little orange globules called drusen contain the 142 beta amyloid peptide. And soft drusen, uh, as they're called, there's different formations of them, but they're all drusen to me, uh, found in 10% of 54-year-olds. So, you know, this is a, a strong precursor for Alzheimer's more severe macular disease, possibly glaucoma, uh, so on and so forth. So I'm going back to the age-related eye disease study because that study, as opposed to the other studies, focused on cataract but also macular disease. Some of the other ones did too, but they really did a great study. So what I want to show you is when you look at a fundus view that you can see the pathologies that relate to mortality. So here's a healthy eye. Um, a pretty healthy individual, and their, you know, mortality rate just goes up with age, normal. Um, but when you have drusen, these little globules of orange in your fundus camera view, then your mortality rate goes up. And then this would be called, so that's called drusen, but it's really classified as dry AMD or dry age-related macular degeneration. Here is the wet form. Why is it wet? The wet is blood. You know, you've heard the term wet work. Well, you've got wet work going on in, in, in your eye. And why would you have blood in your eye? Because your vasculature is breaking down. 
you're literally hemorrhaging blood in the micro vessels in the back of the eye. And you can see when you do that, mortality goes, goes up significantly. Not because you have a hemorrhagic event in the eye, but if it's hemorrhaging in the eye, it's hemorrhaging elsewhere, in the brain, in the heart, whatever. So, but you can, you can see the eye. Very clear, very clear view indeed. And, and this is, uh, you know, this just shows sort of, we don't really see the detailed vasculature. When we look at the fundus camera, you can see the little vessels, but really these globules lie right on the, ves the vessel layer. And so we see this little plaque forming above this highly vascular area in the retina called the cordid. Now, it's really what, what would be called a vascular plaque. It's right on, out in the vasculature. Now, with the wet AMD, we can see here that there's, there's a breakage, and that's where the blood is, is exuding. But this would be called, in cardiovascular vernacular, a, a vulnerable plaque. And the holy grail is finding vulnerable plaques. I mean, there's been huge investments out of Boston when I was there 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, for techniques to, to search for, seek out, and identify vulnerable plaques. Well, it was staring them right in the face, I can guarantee you that, because anybody with macular disease, particularly the wet form, has vulnerable plaques all over their body. And it's likely if you have the dry form, you know, it's on a continuum again, there's a good chance you have a vulnerable plaque somewhere else in your body. That's why your Mortality will go up even with the dry AMD because there are clearly vulnerable plaques lurking elsewhere in your body. Now, the getting into treatment, the sad thing is that, you know, medicine is siloed in, into specialty professions. And so the eye doctors, the, the ophthalmologists who are under surgery at most hospitals are not interested outside the eye. So they're just trying to fix the eye. So in age-related macular degeneration, you start losing some vision. Okay, and the main reason is you have what's called neovascularization. You have new vessels. And where are they forming? Not where they would normally be because the old decrepit vessels are where they would, are, are where they're supposed to be. So these new vessels actually form in a way that can interfere with the path of the light going through the lens to the back of the eye, the retina and the fovea in, in particular. So it affects vision. So what do they do in their genius? Let's stop the new vessel growth. And so they give you these biologics. There's the uh, technical name for them, but they're, they're known as Lucentis and Avastin. There's a big controversy about Lucentis versus Avastin. One was a lot cheaper, generic. Um, so the Lucentis people, Genentech, claimed Lucentis was superior. Superior at what? Killing people? I mean, I don't know what the definition is, but the, 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 the bottom line is, oh, I got a little sarcastic, but I mean, it's completely true because this is Lucentis' own study out of Genentech that when you give these drugs in the eye, and the eye being so vascular, this drug will circulate throughout your body very, very quickly. <clears throat> People with this treatment have much more events. It's really, I should say, adverse events, because that's what they report. But adverse events in this case mean hospitalization, heart attacks, and premature death. Okay, why? Because you need collateral vessels to form around any blockage or any hemorrhagic tissue in your body. So what these drugs do is they stop the vascular endothelial growth factor. They stop the, the growth factor in your body that builds new vessels. That's why Judah Falkman at um, Children's Hospital developed a Vastin. He actually developed it for cancer because he posited that Cancer is producing a ton of new vessels, so let's stop new vessel growth. Well, Avastin proved to be a relatively ineffective drug, probably for a number of different reasons, because you have the cancer, but you're also affecting all vessels. So 
not a good not a good game plan now we're gonna skip on to uh, glaucoma so here's just some images of normal vision versus early glaucoma you can see the vision the visual field um, closing in typical of glaucoma not always but but typical and if you go look at the literature I tried to find this image today and every image for glaucoma was this picture of pressure building up in the retina pressure 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 does build up but it's secondary to the inflammatory process um, and, and Dr. Carter can speak to that and correct me or, or whatever when he feels uh, it feels appropriate but you know glaucoma is measured really best with with the OCT measuring to see if there's damage to the nervous tissue from the pressure but also from the inflammatory infectious process that is unquestionably going on in the retina. And the beautiful thing about the OCT, no different than the slit lamp microscope or the fundus camera, it's all the same. It's a, it's a black box to you. You put your chin to position yourself to stabilize your eye, to get a little flash of light. And in OCT and fundus, you get a, a, a beautiful image and you get a uh, really, it, it's tomography, optical coherence tomography, which is three-dimensional imaging. So we get this beautiful slice of the retinal nerve fiber layer, and then we can also measure the thickness. So we're, you know, in, in this one, we're looking sort of at the retinal nerve fiber layer this way, but we can also, through the interference patterns with light waves, really map out the, the, not just the, the thickness, but the volume very beautiful tool. So here is a <clears throat> very potentially very complex busy slide of what an OCT output looks like. But at the end of the day it's very simple. If you know how to uh, comply with uh, traffic lights and you can read ultimately what the OCT is telling us. So the macula thickness you want it all green and, and we have um, some clear thinning. So we're looking at the thickness of this macula region. Now we're looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer and you can see the red and the yellow and the green are kind of standards for the person based on their age and their gender. Okay, and then the, the black lines, the, the solid line and the dotted line are right and left eye and you can see a mapping of how they compare against standards and you see this individual just has some slight diminution in thickness and these numbers here are the thickness of the tissue measured at different increments along the retinal nerve fiber layer in microns you can see down to 41 microns and you, you can it, it'll, it has um, precision down to say 5 or 10 microns so um, when, it, when it says 53 microns it's 53 microns you know it's, it's not like they should say ah we'll average it down to to 50 because of the lack of precision nope that's 53 microns so if you're if you're working with someone who really knows what they're doing next time hopefully it's 54 microns you know neurogenesis the genesis of new neurons totally possible and i'll i'll show you michael i've added on since since yesterday uh, organize okay. it a little bit better, but I'm going to show some of Dr. Trump's data. Okay. And um, so, you know, optical coherence tomography could even replace MRI, particularly in multiple sclerosis. You know, you can see changes in the retinal thickness, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in depression, autism, mood disorders, multiple sclerosis. Parkinson's disease, ALS, Alzheimer's. You know, it's not exclusive to one type of disease. You know, you have one retina, one nervous tissue, and almost every one of these diseases somehow has an assault on the vasculature supporting these nerves. Just some, um, just a, some a research paper: association of cognitive function with retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Uh, so, better cognitive performance is significantly associated with a thicker retinal nerve fiber layer. Once you get to 80 or 90, it's, it's relatively insignificant. But younger 
this test is particularly good when you're younger, let's say 70 or less. And here's some work from uh, Dr. Tremp's lab, Berisher. Uh, they always sort of go in alphabetical order, so Dr. Tremp was on this paper. But just showing there is going to be variation. That's why the OCT needs to know your gender and your age to match it against standards. Okay, but we can see, a, a, you know, glaucoma, the retinal nerve fiber layer is significantly deteriorated versus healthy. And here's uh, uh, AD, so it's Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, they all, they all kind of fall into the same area. You know, the, there's a group I talked about, Dallas Hack Neurologics. The brain is the brain is the brain. The eye is the brain. We're seeing deterioration. That's all we need to know. Now we need to get, a, get under the covers and find out why. But the beautiful thing about an OCT, it's almost like doing a CNS vital signs to do a cognitive assessment. You get a baseline and see where you are, and then you can measure how you're, you know, how you're progressing, either building new retinal ganglial cells or losing them. And the OCT can measure that very, very well. Um, you know, I, I just have our have our slide here about the continuums and you know we're talking about eye related pathologies so and and diseases so we're up here and it's really the physiology and the risks come first so that's really the most important place to go we have our our risk grading system we have our chronic disease temperature for the physiological grading we published this where we've taken people and just move people down the risk continuum and prove their physiological labs. And some of these people were treated for chronic infection as well. They were part of this cohort. And, you know, why do you want to do that? Because this chart here shows that you have a healthy lens. This is an extracted chicken lens in, in, in solution. You irradiate it. It gets all mottled and, and scarred. And then you put it back into a nurturing solution and, and the tissue will recover. I think that's enough evidence to know that you want to do the right things because, in my opinion, it's almost never too late um, to at least arrest the processes. Now, here's, here's some things never seen before, and I'm, I'm working on publishing it, but um, Dr. Carter has me watching so many videos <laughs> that I can't get to the papers. but. Here's um, one of Dr. Trump's patients, treatment for six months, so significant cognitive improvement, felt he could go back to work. Did not change his habits, but just got treatment. And we can see that there was, you know, Dr. Trump was monitoring him and we we're seeing a change in the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And then over time, we started to see a recovery of that tissue. One's macular volume, and one's the thickness. So we're looking at similar but different, and you can see the trends are similar. So we actually can see improvement in volume and thickness of the neurological tissue. Here's another case study from 03 to uh, 11, so an eight year uh, history, loss of, loss of thickness, and then some gains. And overall, the trend was in the right direction. And the same with uh, the macular volume. At least we saw some gains compared to where Dr. Trump saw this individual back in 03. By 05, there was a reasonable increase in regain the neurological tissue. Here's some of the case studies. Um, more, you know, what we found is you don't have to do heroic things sometimes in your in your life. So. Here's one of these individuals, I forget which one in these case studies, but you know, I, I back titrated their chronic disease temperature from their records. Went from 101.9 to 100.5. Pretty good change. And a C minus to a B in, in sort of grading, so um, risk grading. So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of hope out there, I think, for, for people, even with eye diseases and brain diseases. I mean, the brain diseases are coming after the eye diseases. So in, in some respects, eye diseases may be easier to treat if we get to it in the right way and right form. 
let's see what we have for questions. So um, we don't have a ton. Is anyone except uh, familiar with the new book by Colleen Huber, natural medical doctor titled The Defeat of COVID, 500 plus medical studies show what works and what doesn't. Supports vitamin D, C, zinc, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, no doubt. Thank you, Marlene, for that. Mm -hmm. Can cataracts be reversed without a surgery? We talked about that the first time, Doris, but I'll let, I'll let Dr. Carter pontificate on that point. Yeah, with the, the eye drops, the can see, the l carnosine. Yeah, those, those can be effective, but it's, it, it is a long-term process, a year, two years, what have you. But, um, and again, it still goes back to looking at the underlying driving forces. So ideally, you still find out what's causing the cataract rather than just trying to treat it. And then uh, Melissa says, what's the relationship does Arteriosil have with the eye treatments? You know, I'll just say I've never really had the good fortune to test someone on Arteriosil before and after from eye test, but I'll let Dr. Carter talk about that. Um. Well, I think I, um, um, I really want Dr. Lewis and I to actually do some things with probably Dr. Gelb to find out the efficacy in this realm, but it does show quite a bit of efficacy in terms of you know, reversing coronary artery disease in a relatively short period of time. And it also does have mild heparin-like effects so that you decrease the, you know, the chance of clotting and, and so forth. So, so they are building on, you know, their repertoire of the uses for that supplement. And it's, a, you know, derived from Japanese seaweed. So it is a natural supplement. Yeah, Dr. Carter, Dr. Scott Edmonds out of Philadelphia would be a really good one, too, to, yeah, to get, absolutely. get involved in that. We should have a call, on it, and I think um, both of them would be great to have on as guests to talk about yeah. the eye, because it's just not, both of them have a pretty good appreciation for the systemic aspects of eyes and can talk clinically, which I think would be really helpful. But um, mm -hmm. let's see, Andrew Miller. Yes, you're hired, Andrew. Great presentation. And again, what are some of your favorite nutrients to slow down the retinal degradation <laughs> inflammation? I have one. Cod liver oil. <laughs> yeah. And it's Perfect. Very, you know, um, again, and it's not, it's not ever one thing, ever, just one thing, obviously. But yeah, cod liver oil is a great basis. And there are lots of studies that show, you know, that the omega-3 fatty acids can be quite beneficial. But there are just a whole host of supplements that potentially can, um, you know, be beneficial. But in my experience, and, you know, because I'm also, you know, uh, um, medical director for a uh, glaucoma support forum where there are, you know, thousands of people in there and, and everyone's using different things. But it, again, it still all boils down to what is your underlying driving force. So if you're on 10, 20, 30 different supplements and you think that that's going to arrest it, that's, that's, not, that's not the great yeah. It's, it just seems like another Band-Aid solution, a little bit better than the pharmaceuticals, but not quite. And that's why I love your guys' approach to find those stealth infections, find the actual underlying causes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. And, it's not, of course, it's not just the subacute infections. Is it food sensitivities? You know, right. just driving the leaky gut. Is it heavy metals? Is it mycotoxins from mold? You know, and the list goes on and on. Yep. So, you know... Um, so it's, it's, it's never one thing, and, and that's why a lot of people, especially in the forum, get quite frustrated because they get, you know, uh, supplement fatigue, <laughs> you know, and they're not really seeing any progress. Um, so, so it's a bit, it, of a, bit of a forensic investigation, isn't it? A little bit like a, a CSI. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot Doctor. of fun, Andrew. Never a dull day. But 
My comment on Cod Liver Oil, because, you know, Dr. Carter and I are going to be interviewed again with him on the 26th. And we're not going to bring up Cod Liver Oil because he just, you know, he's of the, um, what's the name of the gentleman? He's 82 years old now. Um, it'll come to me that's against it. But what, what I do with Cod Liver Oil is I rotate the brands. and I, I rotate five brands. You know, it's Rosita that the Weston A. Price Foundation likes. Dr. Tramp used Carlson's only and always. There's Nordic Naturals. There's Green Pastures. And then, you know, an inexpensive one is Garden of Life. And I just, I just rotate them. So if anyone has a particular contaminant, I'm not taking it long term. You know, a, a bottle, I go through a bottle about every two months. I, I don't take it every day. I, I don't really, should, I really shouldn't say that because I want everybody else to take it every day. But I eat, yeah. fi I eat fish at least once a day. Nice. You know, so it's like I had, I had a uh, shrimp curry for, for lunch and, you know, Smokes my smoked salmon and all that good stuff. Might be time for you to give a presentation on some chef skills, then, by the sounds of it. No, I, I, I am the lazy man chef. I, I'll have <laughs> I'll have it whipped up for you in in five minutes with my secret herbal <laughs> thing from Bragg's. But anyway, I don't, and I think that's it. As long as you get the ingredients right, I'm the same way, right? You can go. Yep, make yep. it work. I Carry always, on. I always go for the good one. So Don says, how sensitive is the finding of eye disease with development of Alzheimer's? I ask because at least two patients have moderate to severe Alzheimer's, but uh, not known eye disease, albeit they have not had OCTs. But their visual acuity remains excellent, able to read within cognitive reason without correction or difficulty. See, see, central vision is really caused by the nuclear cataract, which is not titrated to Alzheimer's. So, look, the... the so, I don't have the exact statistic on that. My dad had glaucoma 10 years before diagnosis of Alzheimer's. I think it's very common. I have a number of patients with glaucoma and cognitive impairment. Yep. But, but the focal nature of infection can explain why someone may not have an eye pathology, but have a, but have a um, brain pathology. So at the, at the end of the day, the labs are always the most important. The eye is a really good screening tool, early detection screening tool. So it's not, you know, not, it's not always going to be that precise. But I, I would argue that the other way around, if you have an eye pathology, if you live long enough, the likelihood to migrate into a neurodegenerative process is very, very high. Hopefully that answers that, that question. Um, should you take both cod liver oil and omega-3? I mean, in, in my opinion, you want to get more of the fat-soluble vitamins, which is in cod liver oil to a large extent compared to just omega-3s. So for pill and supplement conservation, Ixnay with the um, omega threes and just take the cod liver oil instead. Now, now Mercola is big on the krill, um, and I'm I'm okay with krill. I don't really know, you know, cod liver oil is a complex mix, mixture. Fish oils are complex mix, mixtures, and unless we have someone doing HPL HPLC high pressure liquid chromatography, followed by mass spec or something like that to isolate all the different things in it then we really don't know. But uh, cod liver oil specifically concentrates those fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, vitamin, uh, vitamin D. And of course you can overdo, you know, omega-3s. You know, there's such a thing as omega-3 dominance that, and, and of course a lot of omega-3 supplements on the market are rancid and they can be, uh, of course, problematic. So, but, you know, doing, you know, the um, you know omega three six uh, ratio is a good test to do to kind of see where you are because you know still there are good omega sixes <laughs> you know absolutely you know you need more omega six and omega three you know you have more muscle tissue than you have brain tissue but you need it um, D would like to know. Would chronic inflammation related to Crohn's or UC cause formation of cataracts? 
you know, it, it sets you up for failure because the gut is so, so critical. And when Dr. Carter and I presented something, we've done so many presentations, I, I can't remember, but might have been to the Black Health Trust, but gut dysbiosis is directly related to elevation of C-reactive protein. Right. And C-reactive protein is directly related to, you know, and I'm not saying 100% in all these cases, to subacute infection, you know, inflammatory conditions. And, you know, people with glaucoma, macular disease, cataract, are most likely having elevated C-reactive protein. I didn't answer that completely, but so, Michael, you want to? Well, no, again, yeah, uh, the dysbiosis plays a role when it comes to that in uh, eye issues. Um, still, you know, there's evidence that shows that there are the bad bacteria that can migrate through the vagus nerve all the way to the brain that, you know, can, you know, start the amyloid deposition. And, of course, we know amyloid is not the cause of Alzheimer's, but, again, amyloid is, it, you know, increases as a reaction to something that the brain is trying to protect itself from. So if you have, you know, obviously your ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are autoimmune issues. So as a rule, you're going to have dysbiosis or, you know, imbalance of the good bac bacteria and so forth. So again, that migrating up the vagus nerve and, and into the brain from a, just a bacterial standpoint, you know, can, can also, you know, reflect in the eyes. And the last question, and it's not really a question, but it's a comment, but it has the, has the term cod liver oil in it, so I can't pass it up. And, but Dora says uh, that cod liver oil from Carlson's with lemon tastes good and it's not thick. The benefits are amazing. I, I just say, you know, just to dispel some um, urban legends, there's no correlation between olfactory scents, in other words, smell, odor, and toxicity. Take carbon monoxide, for example. So a lot of people think that fish oil is, is, you know, you have a little smell and you can smell it and nobody likes the smell of rancid fish, that it's, it's, it's gone. It's not true. We have, we're extremely sensitive down to part per billion for rancid or oxidized fish oils. So I used to refrigerate my cod liver oil and I actually like it thinner. It's easier to go down. So I no longer even refrigerate my cod liver oil. It just stays out on the shelf. It stays stayed out, out on the counter or it's readily accessible. I don't forget to take it. And sometimes when I'm eating a lot of fish, that bottle will last three or four months out in the air. Every time you open it up, a little bit of oxygen comes in. The dilution factor from, from you know, a gas to a liquid is a factor of a thousand. So when you have a little bit of headspace, you know, it, it's minute amount of oxygen in there. And oxygen is 20% of the air. So, you know, you have a, a, a 4,000, you know, volume factor that you have to, that you need to consider. So there's very, very, very little oxygen in, in there compared to all that fish oil. So very little of it can possibly get oxidized. And I do my sniff test. And even when I keep it out on the bench, on the bench, I'm like a chemist, um, I never smell it. And that's why I like eating the liquid. You can't tell how rancid the capsules are. Maybe I'm contradicting things now because they're encapsulated. But when you open that bottle of liquid, it's very clear. And if you smell a little rancidity, rancidity it's not very rancid at all. And it's, it's very good at protecting itself. That's how it protects you. It's an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. Um, it's a redox agent. So anyway, hope, hopefully that's helpful. Because uh, I don't like the thick, cold stuff. I like it. I like it streaming down my throat. And and see you later. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks all, and look forward to seeing you next week. Dr. David Harshfield will be talking about vascular health. 
Bye for now. Thank you, doctors. You're welcome. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you. Yeah. All right.